أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيبنا ونبينا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد المصطفى صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين الغر الميمين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My beloved brothers and sisters, respected viewers, welcome back to our show. Uh, as uh, always, I'm your host Ali Burji and with us none other but Sayyid Shabir Kirmani. Assalamu alaikum uh, Sayyidina al-Aziz. Um, I've been informed that inshallah this it will be our last show for um, the blessed month of Ramadan. Uh, also would like to comment that Allahu Akbar, how fast has this Shahar Ramadan passed? Honestly, yeah, I I don't even recall when did we start fasting and Eid is on the corner. Subhanallah. Indeed, these are the signs of Akhir zaman Allahumma ajjil li waliyik al-faraj. May Allah hasten the reappearance of Imam al-Hujjah, Imam al-Mahdi, inshallah. With that being said, today we shall continue our discussion um, with regards to leadership in our communities and would like to point out what um, is actually the right way of leading in our communities. And inshallah, Sayyid Kirmani will expand and uh, will discuss. Now, for any of you who would like to join our discussion or would like to ask a question, Please, by all means, do so. I urge you to contribute. At the end of the day, we're all benefiting from this. And the lines will be available uh, during the second half of our show. And inshallah, I will inform you. And obviously, um, the numbers will be available at the uh, lower bottom of your screens. Now, uh, we can begin with regards to leadership and how effective it is in our communities. Bismillah, Sayyidina. Bismillah rahman rahim Leadership in our communities is really what we're, we're talking about and what we've been talking about in these past few, few nights and our <coughs> previous Indeed. episodes. Uh, and the whole notion is to get to a point where we can cultivate, we can help groom good leaders for the future. Um, part of that is looking at the leadership and the current status quo of leadership in our communities right now. How are the leaders in our communities? Throughout the globe, not just in the West. Um, although m many of us, we've lived our lives in the West, in the US and the UK and Europe. But even throughout the globe, this could extend to uh, through to Iraq, to Iran, to Pakistan, to India, uh, throughout the, the the Muslim world, for that matter. And the question is, when we look at our different Husseiniyat, Imam Barga, Masajid, and the leadership that is there, Alhamdulillah, many of them are working very hard. And um, leaders, there's differences. Uh, I can't necessarily say that there's one blanket statement to say that all leadership is doing good or all leadership is doing bad. But there's a spectrum. Some, some better, some not so good. But when we look at leadership, we must strive to the best possible frontier. We must strive to the level of the Ahlul Bayt salam, or as close to it as possible. What I'm trying to say is, many of the leaders they're, they, uh, with due respect to them, I mean, uh, many of them are doing this on a volunteer basis, the leadership in the communities. Many of them are doing it on the side. This is not their primary goal. They're doing, if I may say, they're doing a full-time job on a part-time basis because they're giving back to the community. This is one aspect of the equation, to give the benefit of the doubt. At the other aspect or the other part or the other side of the coin, if you will, there's other types of leadership that may not be the best and leave a lot to be desired in terms of effective leadership. That means that are, is the leadership satisfied with what is going on in the community and not looking for improvements? Meaning, to say that this is how it's always been done, this is how it's always been carried out for, for the past 10 years, 20 years, X, Y, Z amount of time, and to say that we don't need to necessarily improve that it may be something that is short-sighted and not far-sighted. 
I don't mean to necessarily change the system of Ahlul Bayt Ali Muslim. No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying perhaps the method we can look and discuss is this the most effective or not in terms of how this institution is run or not. Okay, in which way could we uh, change it? Sure. So, for example, now many times in our communities, to give a full, uh, a full comprehensive view of the scenario, many people uh, who are in the general community they may say, "Oh, this leadership's not doing anything. This leadership's not really giving results." Mm. This is what we talked about in the previous episode when we talked about ownership or sense of ownership. Even when I work in a company or or, or any firm for that matter, if I'm an employee but I still don't have a sense of ownership that I own my work and I have a responsibility and my interest is aligned with the interest of the of, of the the company or the firm i won't succeed our company our firm won't ex- succeed the same is true with the masajid and the husayniyat with respect to them and the imam bargahs if i don't feel that my success is tied with the success of the imam bargah and the husayniyah and vice versa how will we succeed at the highest level is it accurate to say that the state of a community is the reflection of its leadership Yes and no. Yes in the sense that the leadership drives the vision. And this is what we have been highlighting in previous episodes, that the leader's job is to chart the vision. This is where we need to get to. This is where we are today. How do we bridge the gap? How do we reduce the distance and gap between yeah. it? That's really the focus of a leader. There's a very interesting saying that is that the Japanese have, that I've always read and I've always held closely to my heart. And with respect to why is leadership so important? They say something to the effect, of course, the, 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 the saying is in Japanese itself, but it's been translated. And what they say is, fish rots from the top down, or fish rots from the head first. These both translations have been there. And the idea or the concept is that the leadership is the head or the top of the fish, for example. Mm-hmm. And if that is corrupted and that begins to rot, and if that begins to corrupt itself and erode, then the rest of the fish will follow suit. What this means is, if the leadership is not strong in our communities, how can we have expectations for the general community? It's a, it's a relationship that's symbi- symbiotic. It's a relationship that both part- <coughs> parties must benefit from each other. But who's monitoring the leadership? Now, if let's say in a, a, a community, mm. you have a certain leader, yes. and the community is not reaching the potential it should. Mm. Who's monitoring that person or XYZ people who are leading that community? Awesome. And if it can be, or if it's not monitored, who should monitor it? And the problem we usually may, might face with leadership is that people who might sit on the chair of leadership mm. will stuck on it until they, they pass away. Mm. Yeah? And that's a big issue in our community as well. And another thing we, I want to slowly, slowly to discuss about and bring it in is with regards to the youth. Mm. Yeah? And why don't we see the youth getting the responsibility of leadership in the communities. But let's uh, first discuss about a question about monitoring. In your, in your thoughts, in your own thoughts, what do you think would be a good system so the community could monitor the leadership? And if there was any flaws or anything that could be improved, some pressure could be uh, placed upon the leader. So very excellent points that you've said um, with respect to how to create and increase, if I may use the word, accountability in the community. Ah, sad, we heard, we hear this a lot. We've heard this in the past and we hear this a lot. You know, accountability. Yes. And there should be accountability. And this was the manhaj or the school of thought and the view of the Ahlul Bayt Ali Muslim themselves. Accountability is very important. The first and foremost accountability is we are accountable accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his court first and foremost. Ahsan. Unfortunately, for many people, this is not sufficient. Many people, they may they so may I think argue. that's the key word you said, uh, Sayyidina, that first um, we should feel accountability to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I think the key here is that we as a community need to observe the leader. And correct me if I'm wrong, mm. the leader should have a sincere intention that everything he does for the community, he does it so we can see closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hug, metaphorically speaking, Ahlul Bayt and their teachings as tight as possible and hold on, especially in these difficult times we yes. live in. Now, if I observe that the leader might have different intentions, I need, I need to take action, correct or no? It's... it's 
all scenarios are not the same. It really depends. It's a case by case. Case by but, case. Uh, m- m- most common yes. fault in a community, if the leadership is failing, is because there are different intentions. Mm. For example, you said a lot of leaders, yeah, y- um, y- pretty much take the responsibility voluntarily. They have a problem. But certain communities are thriving and are strong enough financially that the leader is working full time as a leader, mm. is getting a salary. Mm. Now, don't need to point left and right, but I'm pretty sure this is happening throughout the world with uh, very strong uh, centers. Yeah, if um, that was the case, should there be um, a board or a council um, in order to monitor these so we can avoid um, certain bias, so people wouldn't start, you know, taking, you know, looking after their own backs, if I could say so that. So there's. Very good. So you've said a few things there, all of which are very important. Um, at this point in time, I personally, uh, there may not be that many communities where the president or the leadership uh, are full time and take a salary, but this may happen in the future. And we shouldn't necessarily look at that as negative. In fact, we may need this. Of course. This is part of what we're talking about uh, in, in this series of shows, in fact. That the whole notion is we should get and establish ourselves as, as a community at such a level financially, economically, but also politically and other ways and in the media at such a level where we are able to finance and establish and help other people do these jobs full time because they are full time jobs. There's no doubt about it. Our, our Sunday school madrasa jobs, uh, uh, initiatives, they are full time. The management of the community is a full time. Of course. Now, if they were, so, sorry yes. to interrupt sure. you, I just wanted to um, share my thought that if they would be able to work full time, that means that they would actually, the community would benefit even more. Ascent, ascent. That, that means you'd improve your madrasas, uh-huh. you'd improve your lectures, your yes. majalis, your activities, your projects. Yes. Yeah? Bismillah. Yes. And it's very important, so, so you've highlighted this well. Now, I, the benefit of the doubt must be given. At the same time, at the same Always. time, there are, we have to be very frank and honest. There are certain individuals yeah. who stifle the growth of communities, unfortunately, mm. because yeah. of sometimes, for example, their ego. They must be the president. They must be the, in yeah. that leadership role. Mm. And therefore, not only do they want to keep it for life sometimes and for long terms, but they sometimes now in some communities, they're passing it down generationally. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> They'll say, okay, I'm the president, now my son takes over the mantle. Yeah, I mean, this, is, this is what's going on. And Some things will never change. Some things, unfortunately, will never change. Now, if... If that is for the betterment of the community, maybe it makes sense. But if it's not for the betterment of the community, then we need to question and ask, well, why is this going on in this particular manner? Why is this proceeding in this particular manner? I'm not talking about those majalis that happen at someone's house in particular. That's their house majlis. That's a private majlis, for example. But if there's a if there's a Husseiniya that that I know in the best interest of the community, it is, it is to have some other leader. Then why not do this? You know, to the extent that even, what, what higher level of leadership do we have in the modern era than our maraja, for example, our, grand, our, our great scholars? Many of them, you'll notice, their children will not, will not become the grand marja after them. Although many of them may be qualified. Many of them may have that level. But it's just to show that this is not this is not something that we're just passing down one after the other. The successorship in the form of, you know, it's just one family that's running. And so anyways, but coming back to this notion, as a leader in the community, we must be balanced. What I mean by that is when we suggest a leader, ego must be tamed. I must recognize that I'm first and foremost con- accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. That Husayniya, that Imam Barga is the house it's for the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam. That is where the Majid of Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam. That Masjid is the house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That's not mine. That doesn't belong. Even if I put up a substantial amount of money, as soon as I say that this is Allah, this is a Masjid that no longer belongs to me. It doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and the people. The scholars, have, in fact, have talked about this, and they've talked about the dual ownership nature of a Masjid. A Masjid has dual ownership. One. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost, the house of God. Second is the ownership of the people. This is why we don't give preferential treatment in the masjid to someone who, for example, is wealthy. They sit at the front. No? But you see it. You see it um, all the time, Sayyidina. And, uh, and it's sad. It's yes. sad. We see we see these uh, bad uh, characteristics which we imply in our everyday lives are... Uh, 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 
evidently uh, visible in our communities. Mm. And what I wanted to stress out is about, I think I believe the key to the solution is the youth. Yes. Because the elders at the end of the day, uh, you know, they've lived a certain lifestyle, they've got a certain ideology, it'll be difficult to change. But how can we take that power to an extent and hand it over to the youth in such a way where the youth can take these innovative ideas with combination with technology and the change of time and era and use it to improve the community. And with that being said, how do you encourage in the first place the youth to take that responsibility or participate? Because slowly, slowly, if the youth would be more interested, and alhamdulillah, we've seen it in certain community centers, we have seen that the youth are taking indeed responsibilities whether it is for arranging uh, the lectures or during peak seasons, religious season, um, like uh, Muharram, for example, Shah Ramadan, you see that in initiative is uh, been taken by the youth. But how can we amplify it? So we speed up the process in order to stop seeing this thing everywhere that, oh, you got the elders of the community leading the way, stuck to their own ways. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, a bit too stubborn to take, take on board um, advices, make changes, and it's getting a bit frustrating because, uh, as you mentioned, we need to actually start acting more. We've been seeing the same thing with our community centres over and over, year after year, year after year, and not a lot is changing. So, in your, in your uh, opinion, how can we encourage the youth to embrace this responsibility to get that feel of ownership in the community instead of just, you know, spending their energy elsewhere. The youth, our youth are a very important aspect in this equation that we're going to get to in a moment. Um, with respect to, to conclude this notion of, of the current status of leadership right now and how we can maybe uh, chart it and lead it to a better path, um, in terms of leaders, we need to understand that there are different demographics. I also don't want to scare, sometimes, this is a very important point that we note, sometimes in our community we're so critical, sometimes, of leadership, that sometimes we scare someone who's sincere to actually take up this position. True. That they're saying that, you know, first sometimes they may think I'm not qualified. Maybe sometimes the person who's actually equipped to be a leader and they think they're not qualified, maybe that's the person who should be the leader, in fact, in reality. Whereas sometimes there's a person who may not be qualified, but he thinks I'm the person who's, a, that, that, sometimes I'm the person that's been chosen by Allah to be the leader. This is, these are things that, that, that one must keep in mind. But at the same time, we shouldn't be so critical to, do, to, to, to a person that they become scared of becoming a leader. When we talk about criticism and accountability, we talk about constructive criticism. And to do that, when we talk about Amr bil ma'roof, nahi al munkar, we must do it within the confines, within the parameters of Islam. Meaning, I should not go out of my way to try to lambast that person immediately right away and say that you are the worst leader and you've done this terrible thing yeah. for the community in public in front of everyone. Of course, you need to deal it with wisdom, with wisdom. and tactics. Initially, this is how Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam did. Yes. How many letters did Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam write to Muawiyah? You can find over 13 in, in uh, Nahj al-Balagha, for example. Letters. Amir al-Mu'mineen, salatu salawatu Allah wa salamu alayhi. Ya Ali, you don't know that Muawiyah is not going to listen to you? He's not going to take your advice? Why? He says, I am fulfilling my responsibility. Amir al-Mu'mineen knows. Amir al-Mu'mineen knows better than anyone that he won't listen, he won't implement. He's doing this notion, he is fulfilling the obligation that is his divine obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what is the responsibility of, of, of the general public to write letters to advise. Now, I have been in this boat myself, unfortunately. There are communities where I've, I've myself have written letters in the past when I was going to a community growing up or other communities. Many, many youth have told me this as well. We write letters, we talk to them, we send emails, they don't respond. This is wrong, of course. There must be accountability. Many times leaders think, some of the status quo leaders in our community think that, you know, there's no voice, the, the, these are just children, the youth are just children. These people, these, to come to your question about the youth involvement, this is the future. They must begin grooming. We must begin grooming the next generation.
In any other environment, any other professional institution, you and I, we, we groom leaders. Somebody who comes out of a university after, for example, four years doing their bachelor's, UCL or Imperial or Cambridge or Harvard, whatever university, they study for four years. Right away after that, do they become the CEO of a company? No, they don't. It takes some time. At the same time, you'll notice in many companies, they have younger leaders as well. This isn't a problem. But there must be some period where you groom them and you train them and you help them to get towards that end. And I think we're lacking, especially in this subject, that who's grooming? Mm. Uh, that, that's where, where we, we have a big problem, that I don't see anyone preparing the next generation to take uh, charge of um, the community. Absolutely. And this, 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 is a, this is a struggle. But what I would propose as a solution, we've talked about some of the issues, we've talked about some of the problems, we've talked about some of the challenges. But as a solution, if I can propose, maybe having every f quarter, for example, maybe every three months, once a month, every three months, maybe every even six months, have a leadership training workshop. This doesn't have to be necessarily open to everyone. Maybe it's just open to the leaders in the community or the potential leaders. Now, somebody, for example, maybe a there's different fields in their professional lives, in their in their work lives. Many of the leaders in our communities they have different fields. For example, somebody may be a doctor, somebody may be a lawyer, somebody may be an engineer, somebody may be an economist, somebody may be a psychologist, somebody may be a, st a stay-at-home parent. All of these people have their strengths. And all of these people have resources that we can lev leverage. Intellectual, lev uh, intellectual thoughts, intellectual ideas, intellectual capital that we can all benefit from. But at the same time, to t take any one individual and say they are an expert in every aspect, that may not, not necessarily be the case. This is very important to note. Because I may be somebody who, somebody may be a doctor, a physician. In a, a physician, even in physicians, there are different categories. There's people who are doing private practice. There are people who work in hospitals. There are people who do a little bit of both. Somebody who may be an employee and their focus is, is, is solely on f providing a service and helping their patients may be very different than, a, than a, a physician who has a private practice. Or forget, for example, even a higher level, a physician who has a group of physicians and they're leading that group. That person, although they have uh, are a doctor or a physician, that person's still a businessman or a businesswoman because you're running a group at the end of the day. There's many programs in the U.S. have popped up that are training, that are teaching, that are having MD and MBA simultaneously, dual degrees, because they realize you have to run. Them. Now, what I'm saying here is this. That person may have a good heart, sincerity, they may have financial capital as well, but they need, we need to help encourage them and help them learn leadership and management. The same is true for many other fields. That person who has studied finance and eco economics and that's the field that they work in, they would be very strong suit, for example, to help deal with the finances of the community, to help deal with being the treasurer, for example. But to make that person... Another field, maybe the public relations director, maybe they don't know how to do that. Well, we need to provide training for that. We need to help people understand how these things happen. And if we don't do that, then we risk, we risk this notion of not performing at the best and optimal level. Many of our youth, they understand certain things about the modern world that others may not, of the past generations, some of our elders, with due respect to our elders. We need them. We need to learn from them. But at the same time, social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all these different social media, some of the youth know better than anyone how to deal with these, how to manage these things, how to leverage technology for the better. Why not learn and hear their ideas? In schools, in universities, some of the most cutting edge things are being in put in front of their eyes and they see this and they live this day in and day out. Why don't we ask them, what's the most innovative, th innovative thing and new thing that you're doing at university and college? And inshallah, with this, we will see benefits in this age and inshallah in the future. Tremendous. Inshallah. Um, inshallah, we're going to shortly go into a short break and mm -hmm. then we're going to come back. Um, now, um, just to pose a question for anyone who would like to call, uh, we would like to continue with regards to diversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And should we encourage, if there is any diversity within our communities, should we encourage uh, diversity of views? And if so, how? If any of you would like um, to join us, 
please get ready if you have any questions prepare them and uh, inshallah once uh, we're back from our short break we'll go through them with Sayyid Girmani uh, stay with us and uh, we'll see you right back Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh <laughs> Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh My dear brothers and sisters, beloved uh, viewers Welcome back uh, to our show T3, Teach, Talk and Thrive uh, Now, for any of you who just uh, joined um, our discussion uh, with Sayyid Kirmani We're discussing leadership and how um, how, um, the right way the, to how basically what's the right way to lead And inshallah um, the question we're going to go through now is with regards to diversity of views And is it uh, possible, could we encourage diversity of views within our community and if so, how? For any of you who'd like to join us, please do so by calling us on uh, 0203 515 And numbers are available in the lower bottom of your screens And inshallah we should have as well WhatsApp number available for any of you who'd like to text so, uh, Sayyidna, diversity of views. Uh, we all know we've got a bit of issues left and right, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I think the most important thing is to um, uh, unite under the banner of Ahlul Bayt and uh, respect one another, most important thing. Now, w with that, in our communities, what's your opinion? It's a very important question and one we must uh, think carefully about, leadership. I've seen in my experiences, leaders, I should first of all say leadership is a very difficult job. It's not easy. And uh, the reward is of the highest caliber for leaders as well. Uh, rest assured, if you, one leads with sincerity and one leads with the best interest of the community and the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam ultimately, uh, and uh, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, definitely inshallah, they will be given their reward at the highest level. But to this question of this notion of leadership and its effectiveness or not in, in cultivating diversity of views, in many lectures, that are, uh, in many communities that I've been to throughout the globe and many of what my friends uh, tell me who are also lecturers as well, um, there's been a notice and many of our, our, our viewers would probably feel the same. Sometimes there's a hidden agenda by some leaderships in some communities. Meaning they want to particularly have this particular viewpoint that everyone must follow their view. And this is something that has not only existed in our community, it's in, existed for centuries, in fact millennia. That <clears throat> the pulpits have been bought and sold by leaders. So for example, people like the likes of Banu Umayya. Banu Umayya were yeah, experts at this. Yeah. What they did was they would purchase, they would purchase khatibs or lecturers or people who are speakers the person who gives the khutbah, and they would pay them. And they would sometimes they would pay them very well. They would pay people who wrote ahadith. They would pay them. They would pay the people who, the amwarikh, like someone who's a historian, who writes history. When they pay them, and they pay them handsomely, whose side are they going to reflect? Whose views are they going to reflect? That's obvious. That's obvious, right? The one who's paying the checks. The one who is writing the checks. Unfortunately, the same is true in some of our communities where, they, where individuals have a particular view and because of that view, they will try to invite that speaker who aligns with their view, for example. And they may undermine the other communities as well, the membership of their communities. Now, their community may not necessarily hold the same view. Their community, for example, this may not be as big a problem in London as it is in the States. In the state, sometimes there are Husseiniyat or there's Husseiniyas that you go to just because there's not another one around. There's not much proximity-wise, there's not much. Now, keeping this in mind, I don't think we should have all these different Husseiniyas. We should have, we should have, we should combine our efforts where need be. But there are circumstances where there's a long driving distance and it's difficult to, to make it. I understand that and I respect that. But a leader must think, in my congregation, in my 
in, in people who are in my community, there may be someone and there may be a group of people, sometimes even a majority of people, who don't see things the way I see them. I must still respect their view. I must still respect their vantage point. And, that does, and what that means is I must not always invite speakers who always say the exact same thing and put, force it down people's views. And they may not have the same view. I must respect their views. There are so many things to talk about in Islam. Why do we always focus on the negatives or always focus on the points of differences? This is a question. A very valid question and uh, it baffles me as well to be honest with you. The differences. Oh, I follow this marja, therefore we will only talk about this and this at uh, 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 this place. Mm. I believe in a political view and uh, this is all we're going to talk about. Every single majlis. That person a young child, a young youth who is attending the Masjid the Husayniya is thinking to themselves, I came here to learn about Rasul al-Azam, Rasulullah. I came here to learn about Amir al-Mu'mineen. I came here to learn about Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam. I came here to learn about Ahlul Bayt. I came here to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran. Why are they dragging me into this politics? I don't want to know about this politics. I don't care about these politics. You leave that, where, you leave that with you. My concern is learning my deen, my religion. Why are you dragging politics into this to this level? Now, they may say that, you know, politics, for example, part and parcel of the deen is part and parcel of the religion. Fair, fair enough. But at the same point, know that there are other scholars who have had a difference of opinion on that matter. And this is what I mentioned in previous episodes and I'm reminding again. If I am a muqallid of a certain marja, and I have the utmost respect, as we all should, of the maraja. If I am a muqallid, I understand that, that the fatawas and the rulings of that marja are hujja on me as a muqallid and may not necessarily imply on someone else. The problem happens when we start imposing our views on other people. There is a diversity of views within Islam. Alhamdulillah, we should benefit from it. Alhamdulillah, I went to the different Husayniyas over in, in London and I benefited from them, alhamdulillah. When we start to having divisive, so this is what I'm saying about encouraging different views. But where should, where can we start to try and fix this problem? Should we um, discuss it with our ulama, our scholars? Uh, focus on the community. What do you think? Where where is uh, the way to your hand on? Who who's responsible for fixing this problem? If, 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 you know, to be honest with you, it would be amazing if we could have uh, uh, politically free Husseiniyas where you could go to a majlis and listen about Abu Abdullah Hussein without expecting to listen about an agenda or a political view, whether it's X, Y, Z. As you said, we could not care less right now. We came for Abu Abdullah Hussein. Now, obviously, to an extent, a political stance, every Shia should have one or yes. every person. But that political stance should not conflict our awesome. own um, interests and our own beliefs, awesome. in, in causing us to divide awesome. and weaken our, our communities. But what, what do you think? Do you think it's crucial that we get the ulama on our side first or just get the community and the ulama will follow? The reality of the matter is the ulama have a very important responsibility here and we must learn from them. At the same time, the ulama, uh, uh, an alim, we must respect ulama. At the same time, we must not necessarily expect the sun, the moon and the stars from the alim, from a particular alim. What I mean by that is, they have a certain role and a certain responsibility. But to throw the ball in their court and say this is just the alim or just the, his view is unfair. is unfair at some level. I agree. At the same point in time, there are some, <coughs> we must not be duped by just clothing or garb. Alhamdulillah, a, a mu'min, as we mentioned previously and you've alluded to, must be astute and smart. A mu'min, a follower of Ahlul Bayt, must not be someone who's naive. This is in politics and other fields as well. We must be very mindful. Does this person have a particular agenda? Is this person able to speak freely? Or are they not speaking freely? This is something that must come up in the discussion. We, when we ask about Islam, the youth, they want to know about the views of Ahlul Bayt salam. They want to know what the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt say. And how I can implement that in my life today. 
I, they don't necessarily, and having spoken to millions of them, thousands of them throughout my career, I'm, I'm telling you that they don't necessarily always care about all the politics that's going on in other parts of the world. Their Islam is, for example, local and the way they live. At the same time, our scholars are very important and they play a very important role. I don't think our, 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 our many of our scholars, for example, um, for example, the likes of, of the ones in Najaf who are tremendous ulama or even in Karbala, we must respect our maraja at the higher, highest level. At the same time, that doesn't mean that we cannot ask for some level of accountability from their representatives who are local, for example. That doesn't mean disrespect. That doesn't mean, for example, I go and shout at them in public. That means the same thing that I mentioned earlier. That write a letter, write an email and request some time to sit with them in private and say that, you know, how can I help you make this better? How can we work together, together to make this better? A, a scholar, many, in many of communities I've also been to, there's a few leadership models. One, the two most common ones that I've seen is, there is a board of directors that leads the views, uh, that leads the community, which is at some level good. But what is the relationship of the board of directors and the alim? Many times I've noticed, and many people have told me as well, that they've noticed this very clearly. The board of directors leads everything, and the alim is just an employee underneath. He just works as an employee. And so his views don't have much weight. Then there's another model that you'll find in many Husseiniyat Imam Bargav Masajid in America, for example, in the West. That the absolute and total power and, and everything is given to the alim, or the scholar. The challenge that we face here is when you do this, that person who is the scholar, although sometimes they may have good intent, maybe some, I would argue, maybe they don't even, I won't go there. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, even that alim is not necessarily an expert in management, finance, and all those different aspects. You need a team there as well. Therefore, to lead a community properly, you need to be in consultation with the scholars. So it should be a 50-50. I'm not necessarily saying 50-50. Okay. What I'm saying is that they must work together. The board and the directors should not feel that this is just an this is just somebody who's an employee and their job is to do khutbah and majalis and that's it. And at the same time, we should not feel that this is someone who is the, for example, the leader of the community, the alim, and everything else. We put the ball, they must do everything And they have absolute power Because unfortunately, some people Not all, very few have When they've gotten this power They have abused it To the point that they just have a one point agenda And for a youth Who's going to the masjid in the Husayniyah They, want to, they don't want to hear about their politics They want to hear about Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salam <clears throat> And inshallah if we implement this We will get to a better future if we start implementing this and getting to that point where we actually benefit from all those components, we start benefiting from the scholars who we need and are extremely important, but also the board of director and the leaders who are also very important. But we should also not neglect the youth who are the foundation, the future. We must all work together and come together to a point where we cultivate leaders for the future. We make the best leaders that we have today. And those scholars, those people, we must take benefits and consult from them to lead and have a diversity of thought, diversity of opinion, and a thriving, successful community now and in the future, inshallah. Ah, Santum Sayyidina, well said, well said. Inshallah, I hope, I hope we actually start implementing these ideas and uh, it will definitely be a, um, a breath of fresh air for all of us because at the end of the day as you said our intention should be sincere just to improve ourselves get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen our communities uh, both spiritually financially socially um, gain uh, a strong foundation so the next generations inshallah eventually could actually have something to work with as a tool for the preparation of Imam al-Hujjaj Allah Ta'ala Faraj al sharif at the end of the day that's that should be the aim for every Shia or every every human being who believes in justice and truth in mm -hmm. the world that we need to go out there and help everyone else as well who's lost but in order to help others we must help ourselves first yeah um, unfortunately I uh, would like to conclude and uh, would like to hope that uh, everyone uh, can uh, you know use 
um, this information to help one another and in their communities. We'd like to thank you so much, Sayyidina, for being with us uh, as being the last uh, show for Shah Ramadan. Uh, we'd like to thank you all, dear uh, viewers, brothers and sisters who have been with us. I hope you've benefited from these programs as much as we have. Uh, with that being said, uh, thank you so much and uh, wish you a blissful iftar with family and friends. Walhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. وآل محمد <تصفيق>